Hello, everyone. Uh, Got to wait for Zoe. The microphone fell because my wife is pregnant, so she's wearing these cute things and has nowhere to attach the microphone. <laughs> and as we were, oh, there she is. This is Zoe. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> we work in we work in Brooklyn, uh, in New York, uh, just one stop from Manhattan, but in in an industrial neighborhood. Um, and. We more and more are becoming a furniture design studio and it's where we want to go, but our process of getting there, we're working really with new, new tools, new processes, has been uh, difficult to find ourselves and we've been working in a variety of mediums uh, and a variety of kind of related design projects, uh, almost business projects. And we're gonna try to give you a little bit of a sense of the place where we work and the process, where, how we've been pulling that together to make it happen for ourselves. So our background is in architecture, but we, as was already said, we don't, we don't do buildings. Uh, and, but our, you know, our background and where we come from has really been working in a digital medium. And what a kind of key piece we have in, in the studio is called a three-axis CNC mill. And it's part of uh, a family of, of tools of making that are directly uh, run from a digital process. That's CNC's computer, uh, computer numerically controlled. And it's really just one of a family of tools, uh, but by bringing that into the office, it makes you understand a different kind of production process and a different kind of design language. And this is David working on the mill, and on the other side is David's father, who's an artist, painter. That, oh yes, uh, I don't know, we just just like trying to look through the images that we we're going to put to kind of like show the studio. And we found this one of my dad, this picture must be like 16 years old when he used to have a studio in Puerto Rico. Uh, I was lucky enough to live in the warm weather also for quite a while, so. Uh, and uh, that's me on the other side sort of like tagging like these files that we're going to run on the CNC. Um, and this picture sort of like more like reflects a sense that it's kind of ironic that we found this picture because uh, my dad used to do like this very big uh, murals and looking at it on the geeky aspect that we like to talk about like it's all like surface based and it has like these really beautiful topologies on them um, and here we are like I don't know almost 20 years later and we're sort of our things are very voluptuous and sensual and uh, the you know, we tend to create sort of like the same process, but we do it mainly in the beginning by using like animation and production tools. But I think also this, this kind of contrast of slides is to say we're using really, I don't know, high tech, I suppose, tools, but trying to use them in a way that's kind of human and, and refers to some kind of longer tradition of making, right? So obviously the, the office is kind of our home base, uh, you know, and I think, you know, when you're trained in architecture, it's always a very kind of clean, anti-material process in a sense. Um, but by running the studio, we've, you know, not that we always want to have our hands dirty every day. You really see how kind of toxic the world is and difficult it is to work that way. But uh, we've had a, a lot of material engagement. I want to point out that the reason that the studio is run like this, that like lab looking and all like sealed. My wife is quite patchouli, so we use like non-formaldehyde materials and all these things, but she has no dust. So even though we do all these things, by the time you're done, you pull out and you look magnificent. So it's, it's, it, that's why maybe we haven't worked with like really big companies yet because we're quite slow in the process. So. Well, as a patchouli one, I mean, we should all be really patchouli. And it's been a fairly deep, lesson, you know, this, this divide between making and design really keeps the designer unaware of how really kind of toxic and, and, and dirty a lot of our materials are. And, and when you're forced to kind of make things on your own, at least at the beginning, it's a real impetus to, it's difficult to find an alternative way of working. But, you know, maybe call us in 20 years and we really will have found some good solutions. But we have that drive from it. 
this is an early project that we were asked to do. It was a wall system. Uh, so there's a set of 72 tiles. And we're working with this uh, machinery and trying to, a, a really brutal machine. I mean, that, see, that three axis mill is a 9,000 pound machine. Uh, and trying to make something that has a feeling of being very uh, brutal, but having a sense of delicacy and precision that we knew was possible. Um, so each of these tiles, we had to make a packaging for them for shipping. We could just flip the geometry inside out and, and make a, an inexpensive foam package. Um, but the idea was to make these really dark, kind of menacing wall, but we worked with um, an artist named Kenzo Minami who projected his drawings into these tiles that gave, a, hopefully, a real sense of delicacy in it. And that kind of, to evoke that kind of contrast has been a goal of ours. Uh, because it's difficult to start out doing fairly experimental work or things you're not sure of the results. Uh, I think this happens a lot in design that we've, you run a secondary business and a model that's a little bit more stable. And so we've run an art gallery from our space. And a lot of the shows have been with artists, out, you know, nothing to do with the studio, sometimes to do with the studio. This is a show of WK Interact. He's a, a street artist, an artist in New York. Um, and that's been a very kind of stable business model for us that's given us the time to do things that aren't, don't always have an immediate kind of payment. Uh, but sometimes we do, we do exhibitions that involve a design studio. Yeah, sometimes we do, uh, well, especially at the beginning, we used to do a lot of collaborations where we would have like an idea of something material that we would like to produce, but instead of us just, you know, oh, let's do a vase, let's, let's do a table, let's do something, we try we thought that because it was earlier and maybe a little bit, you know, uh, not sure how to, we wanted to approach the whole process, we would like collaborate. And um, we've been lucky enough that the people that collaborate with us are like top notch in their fields. Um, in this case, this was a collaboration between Commonwealth and uh, Joshua Davis. I mean, I bet a lot of you must know who. Uh, I think it's Joshua curious. presented one of the earlier Indabas. Yeah. It's given us a, a much more social kind of forum for the, for, the, for the design studio. In the case of this one, we were asked to make, uh, we're working in digital processes, I suppose, and Joshua Davis is working in computational graphics, if you happen to know him. So the curator said, can you make, can you make a piece that's, that's taking these two systems and bringing them together? So we made a porcelain vase and uh, Joshua's graphics were fired uh, in paint into yeah. the vase. This is probably one of the first projects that we tried to do is like what you guys saw in the previous presentation of the animation with the rapid prototyping 3D model. But it was more like we use SLAs a lot, just like any product designer. They use it more for like figuring out that everything is perfect. In our case, we use it as part of the actual design process. That's, that's like the rapid prototyping technology that Craig was talking about, which printed the heads. So we can work directly from the digital model and print it out in plastic. And in this case, it was the first time that we were translating that into another material working with a ceramicist. This, uh, this image is uh, basically what they're showing is uh, because we were learning as the process goes. I mean, that guy was like, well, you want to make this, this 3D forms into ceramics, but there's certain laws you need to abide to. So it would stand and uh, be able to do it as a slip cast, which is like, this molds that you're able to like open up and then you have the piece inside, the final piece. So we had to create like a series of drawings and like partition like our 3D models to start to see areas. This is a little bit geeky, right? I don't know. Like uh, find like areas where it would be like undercuts, which that means is that if you're trying to pull something out, if it has too much of a curvature, it might break or not separate. So by doing these drawings, we could find like areas where we determined that it would be good for actually making the all the parts that would create the whole of uh, the actual vase itself. The partitions. See, you can see a little bit of the partitions there. This yeah. is uh, some shots of the actual show. But I think we'll show you more maybe a little bit about the actual plastics that are printed a little bit in the process of some of the later projects. But I mean, this, I think this is a great, this is a great time as technological tools have kind of shifted and it gives you an amazing kind of engagement with the craft process. It gives you a very direct 
and nuanced control when you're, when you're working with a ceramicist more than to say, listen, we need to make it round and 32 inches in diameter. You can really get in there and, and work with every kind of form in a kind of media that is, is uh, without becoming a ceramicist plus a metal caster plus every, you know, it gives you um, a mode for translating. And I think it's an exciting time to be, to be working in design for that way as a, as a re-engagement with craft. This is it's from the from the studio. This is generally what they make. They uh, make all these kind of birds for the White House and stuff. And scenes of destruction. Um, so uh, this is like a good example of what happens is that you you know we use these collaborations to like raise questions of things that we want to do, and this was followed afterwards by a series of vases that they were like uh, our own curiosities that we wanted to explore, and. These are meant as ceramic, uh, and what they are, it's, you know, they're called orphan vases because nobody asked for them and they don't have a place to go but to our own studio. And maybe some like close friends that they're like, please can you make one for us? And they have a one-off or something if you want to call it. Uh, but uh, uh, basically these three pieces, what they're doing is just like uh, exploring like three different methods, methods of, uh, uh, modeling like you know just very briefly like one is made like with nerves nerves the other one is a subdivision and the other one is a combination of both and this is just like an excuse for us of like uh like testing like different like uh ways of actually creating all our language as the projects keep going i think there's i mean for good reason there's been a fair bit of reaction against design working in the context of galleries recently and not, not to dismiss that, but I think for us, because art has less uh, constraints, has less demands, it's also something that's been very useful to be able to make a project which is, has, has a little bit less demands and then to take that art gallery project and try to really embed it in a product that, that works with the more complex systems of design really. So, as much as I think that sort of times are changing and that kind of genre is going to be cleansed a little bit, I think, I hope that the kind of good sides of that, that remain. <laughs> this is a, a commercial art project we did for Warp Records with uh, photographer Tim Sassanti and graphic designer Build, uh, which was very much a visual project. We were doing the record art for, for an album of an LA musician. And you know, really, you're, these are a couple of the final pieces of the of the records itself. And you know, when you come from, I don't know, certainly our background in architecture, there's always this kind of embedded paranoia of thinking too much in terms of the visual. But uh, for example, projects like this, we made these these sculptures, which became uh, just the illustration and the atmosphere for the music. And not that that sort of the be all and end all of, of design, but it's to allow yourself that kind of freedom is something that, to just look at your work only in one set of terms and not to try to satisfy all kind of design requirements is something that we enjoy doing and try to pull back into furniture. And we'll show you in the next project. So this is the, the final record art. And you know, it's something that is, more bodily and evocative than we can really <laughs> do in a kind of mass market sellable product, but it gives us almost a, a goal to reach, uh, to strive for in, in a material. Yeah, just as, a, just as a quick side note about that, like the really cool thing about this is that working on projects that you know, allows us to like, just explore all these modeling things we want to do or, or this uh, design language, when they're based on like things that are going to be photographed, you know, it breaks all the scales. So for us, it's like the most amount of freedom you can achieve. And actually, I don't know if I should, but I'll tell you anyways. This this picture actually was just it was just shot inside a sink, and and the designer studio. He just this guy just finds like all these places. He dumped it inside the sink and made this little like paste and dropped the models in there, and you know, creates this really like luscious effect that when we when we saw it, we you know. It was amazing, but the great thing about the project is that because there were three people involved, each one with their own set of you know rules, at the end the overall effect was totally unexpected. But uh, we were all pretty pleased. 
uh, and this idea of the body of the bodily, I guess, has been kind of quite important to us. This is a series of furniture uh, called the Lard series. We've called it the Lard series, and there are three fairly simple functional pieces: uh, a table, a stool, and a bureau. Uh, so this is the table, and it's quite a minimal shell with three leaves below here which slide uh, in and out to contract, to expand and contract the table. Uh, and while there's a very minimal shell, the, these, these leaves that slide in and out, are the idea was to model them based on the idea of lard or kind of forgotten fat. And, you know, lard is this kind of 19th century, you know, cooking ingredient or a historic cooking ingredient, really, and that's something that's been, you know, replaced by hydrogenated vegetable oil, oils and margarines. Um, but it's actually, you know, it's something that's quite classic and, and sensual in and, and its whiteness and something that we were trying to pull in uh, formally. But, I mean, obviously, there's a kind of tension within fat. We spend a lot of time avoiding fat. So that kind of, um, to find form which has that kind of psychological tension with it, with within it. It's not about only just sort of making something nice, but making something that resonates with people, hopefully, in a kind of complex way is, is a little bit what that, what that is about. And so this is... Um, More geek stuff? Yeah. <laughs> this is a, a drawing of the sheets. This is generated from the normals. Yeah, like these drawers, I mean, they're really visceral. I mean, like the idea was a, a little bit of a play between like, you know, the, the standard type of furniture, which is like very minimal, very clean line, a little bit of a reveal and everything like very peaceful and relaxed. And, you know, trying to add like this level of like, you know, like, uh, yes, like being very uh, visceral. By the way, English is my third language, so I sometimes <laughs> spare me. But, uh, uh, but uh, you know, like, the the idea was like not only to create like a pure like visual affect but rather that also what it has is that it is actually quite functional like what we wanted is to create a piece that was just like this uh very voluptuous interior with a very minimal outside but at the same time that it performed so if you put your hand into like that and you just try to pull him or push him it actually feels quite nice in your hand so there's no need of adding like extra hardware like a like a handle or anything like that it was more like pure form material and effect and uh, all these she all these sheets really function as handles but not in the sense of um a uh, hyper-designed ergonomic handle, which you expect the hand to reach into in one way. It's really a landscape of grippable areas. And I, you know, and I think in the kind of idea of, you know, what is functional, I think sometimes it's important to say function, you got to get within a range. And if that sort of surface is grippable or, or that, that works, you know. Yeah, and This is the bureau. Yeah. And now it's, I mean, this is, my favorite piece. I mean, Zoe likes the table better, and there's a stool. I guess Bao will like the stool better. Which actually, for the baby's room, you'll see the the last one. We're actually making one. I just think it's way too cool to play with cars on top of it. Um, uh, yeah. Again, this is the idea of like being very minimal on the outside, but being very revealing. I mean, this uh, this piece of furniture. We try to do it. I mean, we're very. We try to make it as good as possible without having like a huge. Uh, corporation behind us, you know, so this this whole system like actually operates quite beautifully like it has a whole balloon system which basically when you touch it it just opens like very 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 slow but because it has this really intricate interior uh, and it's a little bit heavy it actually opens really slow and it reveals this and if so if you've never seen it the actual visual effect is quite compelling. I think also within the kind of emergence of digital modeling as a, as a means of, of production, there's been, you know, all of a sudden design was presented with a huge amount of freedom. And I think what we're trying to bring back into it is a, is a sense of a precise craft in juxtaposition to moments of freedom and that, 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 that brings more tension in every piece and is, you know, an evolution of, of a, a way of design that's been quite amateur, naturally. Not to criticize it too much. And this, this, is, this is the stool. It was photographed by uh, 
this guy that we showed before of the warp records. But again, uh, it's as excessive surfaces, but within the very precise boundaries of a cube. I mean, they're, they're really neat because, I mean, they're not, you know, we, we, we don't try to just do like this blobby, gooey things. Like, um, when we went back in school, like everybody was into like, uh, wow, look at all these things you can do now with computers are really blobby and voluptuous. But it always bothered us that it's always with the word. If you go to academia or something like that, the best word to use is the possibilities of which that means pff, you don't know how to do it or don't have an idea, but it looks really cool. And it gets you off the hook that way. And for us, that really kind of like bothered us. Um, bothered us. Like we were like, well, if we're going to do something that tends to be a little bit like intricate, we want to figure out how to put it together and at the same time be quite efficient. Um, this piece is actually, they're all like, uh, you know, all the sides are actual planes. This is not like a full solid piece. It's actually assembled. Um, and they actually, they're stackable. So. The top is, 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 is just like the sides like that. But it actually, when you put your ass on it, it actually feels quite nice because they're quite even. It doesn't feel uncomfortable or anything. It feels quite nice. And they stack on top of each other. They actually meet because the bottom of them, they're actually uh, kind of like the reverse of the geometry. So they actually, you put them on top of each other and they, they actually like sit really nicely. Another project that's working with some kind of relief, This. This flooring project was called, we called it the fleshless floor, and it was um, generated by a, by a fluid animation system. Yeah, this, this, we always get into trouble sometimes, like we want to do, okay, we're like, okay, let's do a, let's work on a, on a tiling project. Okay, we cannot just do like simple tiles. We had to go ahead and find a, you know, we started using real flow, which is a, thermofluid dynamic software, like what you see in like commercials and things when like water flows and things like that. But what we wanted to do is actually find a way of controlling it to a level that it would be like millimeters or actually just tame it because that software, even though it has a scale, the files are gigantic and they're all over the place. But anyways, we just kind of like control it to a level that it would just be like this sort of like, like threaded, how do you call that rug? How do you say that in English? Right? Like a distressed rug. Mm -hmm. oh, we just made a, a very minimal intervention into plywood. Uh, so you have a very regulated tiling system and then we've thrown this field of gas and waters on top of that. And we can convert that geometry into something that is, you know, real flow geometry into real machinable geometry. And just working with a really inexpensive plywood can, when you, when you do that slight reveal, it reveals the, the levels of the different colors of wood. Um, and after staining it in a, staining it white, we tried to get a, like a feeling of really translucent thin skin where you can see the veins below. So, I mean, the, you were working with a really complex system here, obviously. I mean, in terms of, every, the, you know, every bubble is a different size, but it's not really a kind of complexity that we have to be in control of at every moment. Um, yeah, so uh, I think, you know, it's a way of making a fairly simple process of something that can give something that has something that's quite uh, evocative in a complex way in the way of how else would you make something that looks like thin skin? <laughs> this, uh, we just finished this recently. This is a series of masks. One is a male, one is female. Uh, they are uh, for a film company. So uh, what we tend to do with these projects is projects like this. I mean, they're a good excuse for us to like, keep exploring ways of like, not only like do like modeling, um, things that are very voluptuous and they kind of have like a sexual feeling of it in certain moments, but also like try to use it as an excuse for like uh, keep testing like different techniques. At some point we would like to see on pieces of furniture because uh, we really are really uh, comfortable or we really love the idea of working at that scale. It, it gives a lot of feedback and it's quite beautiful and we're addicted to furniture anyway, so it kind of works perfectly. <laughs> but. Um, so basically, like those masks here at this stage, like, uh, you know, you have all the form, but then we wanted to play with ideas of porosity. So what we were trying to intend is uh, sort of like create like these moments where you can have like pluck hair into them and create like a variation from this very like shiny, smooth surface. Um, 
So what we used was a pony hair. Um, and Zoe and I put more than 32 hours plugging this hair um, uh, on this mask. It was, uh, it was therapeutic, to say the least. Um, uh, We've searched all the Barbie forums, have had to replug the hair. So if anyone has hair plugging questions. Yes, exactly. In the end, of the easiest one was just to like uh, turn and twist. Um, but it's true, we're really happy to get these sort of, I don't know, a little bit bizarre commercial commissions, you know, because we couldn't, it's difficult to play with something like this in the field of furniture, but here, you know, in the end, we ended up having to mix this biomorphic or kind of near figure plastic pieces with something that really is real, this pony hair, and all the holes in that are gonna determine how all that hair falls out. And this is something we'd love to pull into, into, into furniture, into production pieces. How we can do that, I don't know, but the, the sense of fake natural and real natural is, is, is really exciting to us. And one final project we'll show you. Uh, this one's called, this is a set of two door handles. And we just got them back before we left, so we haven't been able to fo uh, photograph them on a door. You're gonna have to use a little bit of imagination. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is a, a commission for us. Uh, and so we worked with the same uh, SLA plastic printing process, um, but this time instead of casting them, say, into the ceramics, we cast them into bronze. Uh, where we work in Williamsburg is in Brooklyn has a really good network of, of small workshops uh, and including a few blocks away there's a bronze casting uh, unit. Um, we named this the Morphinas. I'll give you a little bit of a, I don't know, something that yeah. you can have kind of your own tr criticality to this idea, but we named it after this painting which is a Catalan painting by um, a man named Rusignol, and this painting is of a woman high on heroin and bourgeois woman at like four o'clock in the afternoon, but you know, he really painted this out of the, the pleasures of, of heroin, but you know, obviously there's a dark side to that. But it, I think it's, you know, symbolic of that era in, uh, I think this painting was painted in 1880. Uh, in Catalonia, and these are another precedent that they come from. These are two handles, door handles by Gaudi, Antoni Gaudi. Uh, well, the one on the left is a door handle, and the other one is is an eye hole, uh, also cast in bronze. And that that period in in that city or in that region of what's called Modernisme had a real kind of uh, luscious formality, let's say. By the way, if you guys know anything about Gaudi, don't give all the credit to Gaudi. There's a, all that, all that metal work is done by Jujol, which he's actually the mastermind behind all the work. Um, he's the guy that was more like out there and crazy and like very passionate. Um, and unfortunately, it's the, most of the credit of things that actually like capture people's eyes were done by this other guy, which he was, he did pretty good, but um, he could, could never outdo Gaudi, unfortunately, I think. And Gaudi, you know, he was a very, very pious Catholic. And, you know, in the same, within the same circle, here's Roussignol, the painter, and he's gone off to Paris, and he's kind of really entranced by the, the, the benefits of heroin, the pleasure of heroin, uh, you know. But, so they're coming from very different angles, but there's, there's an era that really defines that city and that time. Um, and, in fact, had a real counter movement against it of a, of a, a reformation before and, and something called Nocentisma no afterwards, which was looking back to Rome for a kind of purity and kind of a cleansing of the, the kind of Excess. formal yeah. ex excesses. Um, so just to say that there's, you know, that kind of form is something that's always psychologically meaningful and um, I don't know careful to kind of keep your mind on what that what that means to people so this is actually one of the raw SLAs uh, for the door handles that we did uh, so you know we model uh, we upload that to a server in Oklahoma they print it from a vat of resin and it's sent to us by courier a few days later and we can use that to cast it in this case into wax it's an investment cast in the, in the bronze casting process, 
the wax gets burned away. Um, some more of how, how this is done. It's poured into the bronze. Uh, yeah, it, this, <laughs> when this it is pretty funny because uh, that's Zoe and I actually, I'm not gonna say what she said when she saw this. She was like, what the? <laughs> because, uh, you know, we were expecting like this really shiny and things because we've never worked with bronze. We didn't know the actual, all the hard work that actually goes to to make it really beautiful. Um, so when we saw this, we were like, okay, uh, we've been on this for like five months now and uh, this looks fantastic, it's awesome. Uh, but obviously we had no clue of what was going on, now we understand, but at that point it was quite frustrating because we were like, oh my God, uh, yes, that's awesome, <laughs> really cool. I guess uh, craftsmanship and computers are not really talking to each other yet or something, <laughs> but uh, I was proved wrong anyway. Well, I, I think that maybe from here that this is the final pieces after they were they were polished. Uh, there's a, I think it's a really exciting time to work because, you know, on a relatively small scale, this is really small scale work compared to working within mass production where you really have to get things perfect before a company is going to invest in a, in a large infrastructure to make that one piece a thousand times. There, there is an opportunity with a shift in technology to really re-engage with craft and to really have kind of quite um, a specific conversation with the making. And at the same time, you always have to be open to the fact that things come like this and you better be open to whatever that, that studio that's making things um, is. But I, 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 I think that's what we like, that actually in the end to see that uh, what it allows us to do is that the work doesn't look like fully digital. I mean, I, we really do not like looking like super sci-fi. Indeed, what we like is that by using like craftsmanship and craftsmen in every field, what it produces is this other level in the work. I, I, but I do think that um, some of the kind of pressing questions are, you know, what does one need? What, what is sustainable? What are healthier ways of making? Um, but I think at the same time, it's also very important to always be engaging with the new. And I mean, you know, David and I are not sure we're here to talk about our process. I don't think we have any kind of answers for what's coming up, but I think we've had a lot of faith in saying, okay, we're going to engage with something that we don't quite know how to control and have faith that from that we can really find some new processes of making things. And, and I really think that we're you know, we're a few years into things and really hopefully our best work will come 20 years from now. And you now it's a little bit like having a baby. We haven't had a baby before and I don't really know what it's all about, but I have faith that some new things will come from it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.